yesterday because it really captures what we're trying to accomplish through these last couple of days in terms of citizen science in action. And I'm going back to quote Eric Bonham, uh, a wise elder, one of my mentors, about engagement of community through stewardship is a credible formula to be encouraged and mainstreamed at every opportunity. Stewardship operates under a different dynamic than the private sector or government. Stewards are drawn together for a common cause, like-minded individuals with a vision for the greater good and passion to make a difference. And look around at your tables and you, you know what I'm talking about. So this combination of citizen talent is aligned with local governments, a local government that is both visionary and focused. Outstanding achievements are not only possible, but realistic. A very profound observation it was a distillation of what Eric Ron has observed over the last 30 plus years in terms of his work with the stewardship sector. So the two beacons of hope, the Boker and Brooklyn Creek restoration success stories, they are inspirational and that's why they're on the program because the stories are inspirational and the people who will tell those stories, they're inspirational in terms of what they have been doing in the trenches. We consider them to be provincially significant. Um, they provide a contrast. You have Boker in the urban heart of the capital region. You know, it's just all pavement to a large extent. And you have Brooklyn in the suburban Comox Valley. But this is what <coughs> is the commonality. Each demonstrates how local government partnerships, the stewardship groups, can, and this is the key phrase, improve where we live. Improve where we live. That's the ultimate goal of restorative development. This, this is a slide. I'm going to quote myself because, you know, in terms of my role in meeting with boards and, and councils and, and making pitches on behalf of the Interregional Education Initiative and, you know, going before the, uh, the Capital Regional District Board, actually it's one of their committees, and highlighting the significance of, of Boca Creek in an interregional context. And this is what I said, I'll read to you because the printing is kind of small, this is the transcript. The Boker Creek Blueprint and the 100 Year Action Plan was a game changer. It is a game changer. It continues to be a game changer. And it is provincially significant and precedent setting, it is also inspirational. And you'll learn from Jody Watson why it's inspirational. The second paragraph, and this reflects my observations as a professional engineer, as a guy whose who's whole life has been steeped in water resource engineering, in my 40 year career as a professional engineer, there is nothing that equals poker. Nothing. And the reason it is so important is that it gave the rest of us a vision of what can be. In this region, you, I was referring to the politicians, you moved it from just having reports to actually having action. And only Jody can tell the story in a way that will give me to those words. But I do have to quote you, Jody, because <laughs> I've known Jody the best part of 15 years, and uh, shared your trials and tribulations and said, Jody, you're doing great work. Keep it up, keep it up. I can't beat you down, right? And um, but I think a lot of the personal, like, you are the champion, not the only champion, but you are the champion within local government who really carried the, carried the torch and also served as, as chair of the Boca Creek Initiative, so two, men, two hats. And when we, when we released the Yonga Guide in 2015, I asked the, uh, for the various regions to keep people to provide us with their kind of an op-ed, which we included in the document, and I extracted these two sentences from Jody contributed. Our collective baseline or memory of what a healthy creek should look like has shifted dramatically. <laughs> In Boca Creek, however, this is the good news, we are changing the way we develop our land by attempting to re-engineer the hydrological function back into our urban landscape. We are, in some ways, cultivating a new land ethic. A new land ethic. It starts with the land ethic. And the reason, Joey, I, I extracted that quote, is I thought it was a perfect way to transition into the work of Daniel Pauly. Of those who have a fisheries background, does the name Dan, Daniel Pauling mean anything to you? Any hands up? Yes, there's a few. There's a few. Daniel Pauly actually, you know, is a Frenchman, but has uh, been a big part of his career has been at UBC. 
He's a global fishery scientist. He's the guy who 25 years ago coined the, the, the term the shifting baseline syndrome. And when you hear him tell the story of how he did it, you know, it was one of those things that somebody else was supposed to do, do the uh, um, preamble for a, you know, a proceedings at a conference and, and uh, he faulted on it. And so he was asked the last minute to do something. And he produced a one pager and described the concept of with, new, with each new generation, the expect, expectation of various ecological conditions shifts. The result is that standards are lowered almost imperceptibly. And you know, there's there's the curve showing the, the, you know, the progression downhill. What we're really talking about I think, over these last two days is bending the curve in an upwards direction. And we're fortunate for the most part in British Columbia that we're not as far along the curve as other regions are, so there's a chance to, to really realistically bend the curve. But as Bob Sandra said a year ago, it's the hard work of hope. Right? The hard work of hope. But you know, you've got to believe, you've got to believe that communities can re reset the ecological baseline if they would implement standards of practice that restore a desired watershed condition. Achieving this would take time, commitment, and perseverance. So the significance of focusing on, on Boker and Brooklyn is that we can see a decade of history of perseverance and commitment. So you know if we can get from there to here, we can get from here to there. Briefly, in terms of uh, the Comox Valley, and Tim showed this map earlier, just making the point that you have three jurisdictions, three lenses. And that in itself is a challenge. You know, and the Upper Creek, uh, Upper Creek Shed, the ecology is subordinated and engineered drainage systems. The Middle Creek Shed is a reactive situation in terms of development proposals. And the Lower Creek Shed, which is where the extensive investment by stakeholders has taken place. Now the irony is, about a decade ago, as a partnership, we identified Brooklyn Creek as, 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 a, as a prime Greek prime case study for us to follow and, and, and tell the story, but we're actually coming at it from a different point of view, because we, we saw it as an example of, of the consequences of upstream actions on the downstream resource, and because we had seen the, the level of investment that the town of Comox had to spend over that decade, we thought, okay, this is, this is going to be a good one to get the data to do the analysis, analysis that, was, that Tim was talking about. The unintended concert, or un unintended outcome of selecting Brooklyn for this particular, uh, for, the, for the work that Tim did was discovering this wonderful story, a wonderful story of the collaboration between the local government folks and the stewardship sector. So after Jody, after the Jody hour, plus or minus five minutes, we'll have the, the Comox hour, plus or five minutes, and really what's what we have to accomplish here is the blending of three perspectives to showcase the long-term value of collaboration guided by a shared vision for Creek Shed restoration. And, and in, terms of the, in terms of the team, you know, Al Fraser is going to kick off and provide the context of the Comox journey with a focus on partnerships. And I just love it when I've ever talked to Al because he is so passionate about Brooklyn Creek and so passionate about the work relationship with the town and he has with, with, with the Brooklyn Creek uh, Watershed Society. And so he'll kind of set the scene for then, for, uh, for Christine Hodson, who represents the, you know, the Brooklyn Creek Society, to provide the overview of how the volunteer work fits with the goals of the town, thus making the creek a better place. And I guess it was, you know, you have to have the conversations under to, to hear the gems. And, you know, when I was at, when I had a meeting with, with Al and, and with Martin Comenzo is coming up next about why you know how to approach uh, the Brooklyn story, and, and it was it was just um, you know with 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 with, with Al. I remember the, remember the story that he said about well we get political support because the councillors all went with the walking distance and maybe think of your story, Joey, where getting them all to talk about that it's real to them. And, and if it's real to them and they see the value from the community perspective and that, and that support, then it's so much easier to get the funding. But you still have to fight the initial battle to get their attention, right? And then uh, Margaret is really going to close out the, the Cobox trio by just elaborating on the building block process that they had to go through in the evolution of the town of Comox's in incremental process for implementing changes in development practices. And you know, 
I think the key message is, for those in the stewardship sector, you have to appreciate, for those in, the, in, in local government who are in the trenches, it is very much an incremental process, process to, to bring about change. It can't happen overnight because you, you know, you have got to work the system through, the change in the system through step by step, and those steps can be frustratingly long, but the beauty of these two stories is the steps did happen. And they reflect what we call a new form of governance, because first there has to be the vision, right? Whether it's Boker or Brooklyn, you know, sharing a vision about what the potential is for the water, for the creek, uh, the community involvement, the bottom up, and then the support from the municipal decision makers, the champions within the system who will make things happen. And then, you know, if you've got all those ingredients in play, then you've got the, the momentum to begin to apply design with nature as a consistent future approach to restorative development. But you have to have all these ingredients in place. So what can stream keepers do, right? Think about it. And the classic, the classic photograph of the Mimi's group, um, you've got to educate yourselves on why and how the, the water balance broke the whole system way of thinking uh, would reduce erosion and protect your creek. That's why Dave Derrick's finale there was so good, wasn't it? Because you know, it initially approached the conversation by saying, well, these are all the things you could do within the Greek system, and they're all gonna, you know, they're all gonna be expensive, and they're, and they're gonna alter, you know, alter everything, but you know what, if you haven't solved the basic problem in, in, the, in the watershed about how you manage how, what happens with rain, then what have you actually done? You gotta go back to, back to the source. And so what we try to do with these two days is, is give you some of the language and the thoughts and the understanding you'll need to be more effective in your own communication in your own communities. And at the end of the day, it really does come down to expanding your involvement and your influence beyond the creek channel to, a, to restore the wider balance, the wider water balance. Joey, this is you. <laughs>